I am beyond thrilled to welcome Marianne uh, Seacart to our book club. And I think actually, Marianne, you are our second, sort of this is just about the anniversary of our second year because we um, we started in the first kind of British lockdown um, to, in 2020. Um, Marianne, and some of you will know this, has been a force to be reckoned with as a political journalist for several decades, including assistant editor of The Times, um, a presenter on many programmes for the, the BBC4, Radio 4, um, start the week profile, lots of, of, of quite hardcore analysis, I think. Um, she's also chaired the um, Social Market Foundation Think Tank. She's a visiting professor at King's College London, um, was a visiting fellow for a year at All Souls College in Oxford and is on many boards, including the chair of the Women's Prize for Fiction this year, which is brilliant. Um, firstly, Marianne, um, I just wanted to say thank you for the book, really, because, and I know I'm not the only one, for me, the it was really validating to read these stories of, of um, and, and stats of impressive women who are experiencing some of the things that I've least have experienced. So first of all, thank you. And, and well. You're very welcome. You're very um, welcome. I really want to give women ammo, actually. And I wanted to make them to understand that it's nothing personal. You know, we tend to beat ourselves up and think it's our fault. You know, we're not being confident enough or eloquent enough or articulate enough or whatever it is, actually, we're just being too female. <laughs> and however we behave, we're probably going to be punished for it. So I sort of, in a way, wanted to reassure, I mean, it sounds depressing, but there is a way through. But, uh, but, uh, but I also actually wanted to reassure women that it's not their fault a lot of the time. Do you want to, just for those few people who may not have read the book in full, just roughly what is it what's the structure of it and why it's so important especially and some of my lovely male colleagues have um have read it and commented how important it is for men to read it this is not just a book for women oh no it's it, it it's almost more a book for men actually um so the authority gap for those who haven't read the book I, I, I'll, I'll do it very quickly because those who have read the book will otherwise get bored but anyway um it's a measure of how much more seriously we still take men than women we're still more reluctant to accord authority to women than we are to men. And when I say authority, I mean both authority in terms of expertise and competence, and also authority in terms of power and leadership. And as a result of this, we often underestimate women and we patronize them and we interrupt them or talk over them. Uh, we fail to listen to what they say or read what they write. We challenge their expertise disproportionately and we quite often resist them when they are in a position of authority over us. And so I look at all the evidence for this. Um, there's a huge amount of academic evidence, research evidence showing that this is the case. There's also the fascinating evidence of people who have lived as both a man and a woman. And I think this is actually the, the real slam dunk evidence of the existence of the authority gap, because normally suppose you're a woman and you're I don't know, up for promotion against a male colleague and he gets the job and you don't. And you may suspect that bias was at play, but it's terribly hard to prove because you're different people and he may genuinely be better than you. But when you talk to trans people, they are exactly the same person with the same intelligence and experience and personality and body of work and ability and all this sort of thing. And so if once they start living in the other gender, they are treated quite differently, then what you've managed to do is to control for all the other variables and isolate the only one that matters, which is gender. And sure enough, I tell lots of stories in that chapter about trans men, so people who used to live as a woman start living as a man and say, oh my God, this is incredible. People take me so much more seriously now. They respect me so much more. They listen to me more carefully. I can get away with so much more. You know, they just understand how much easier it is living as a man. And conversely, trans women who've led this life of male privilege all their life without even noticing it, suddenly once they start living as a woman, they come up against all this behavior and they say, oh my God, I had no idea how much sexism there was in the world until I started being at the butt end of it. <laughs> um, so I thought that was fascinating. Anyway, so I, I proved the existence of the authority gap for the few skeptics out there. Uh, 
And then I try to explore where it comes from. I look at what happens in childhood. I look at uh, the question of confidence, whether it's merely because men tend to present themselves more confidently, present their views more confidently than women do. We therefore accord them more authority. And I look at the difficulties that women have in getting confidence right. Because if we're not confident enough, no one does take us seriously and we're just rolled over. But if we do act as confidently as men do, people don't like us for it. They tend to recoil and start to use words like, uh, oh, she's quite abrasive, isn't she? Or strident or aggressive, bossy, overbearing, uh, scary. You know, all these words that are used of women are never of men, simply because they are displaying the same level of confidence as men. And so it's not enough just to blame women and say, oh, well, you should just go on an assertiveness training course or you should just lean in more because when we do, we get punished for it. So I look at that and, and the great mis uh, mistake we often make of conflating confidence with competence and they're absolutely not the same thing. And I think a lot of men get hard and promoted because of their confident demeanor rather than their underlying competence and women get held back for the same reason. And then I also look at speaking time because men on average in every public setting will speak longer than women will. And that perhaps lends them more authority. Uh, there was one wonderful study, which I cite in the book, and I'm sorry if you've read it, but it did make me laugh, uh, where a group of men and women were given two paintings by Dürer to look at. And they were asked to talk into a tape recorder for as long as they liked about these paintings. And the women spoke on average for 3.17 minutes. And the men spoke on average for 13 minutes, in other words, four times as long. But even this wasn't accurate because three of the men were still talking when their 30 minute cassette tapes ran out. <laughs> um, this is just an illustration of how much more men tend to talk than women. But again, it's very much like confidence. If we talk as long as for as long as men do, again, we get punished. People, people will think that we are less competent if we talk too much. And I use the dreaded air quotes, which I normally hate, because talking too much may actually mean just talking for the same amount of time as men. Because studies show that if a man and a woman talk for exactly the same length of time, we will perceive the woman to have dominated the conversation. And then there is a backlash against women who talk too much. So I, I, I go into these explanations and then I look at uh, I look at how women are also biased against women, that this isn't a man bashing book because we all suffer from the same unconscious biases because of the world we've all grown up in. Uh, that doesn't let men off the hook, of course. It means we've all just got to civilize our reptilian brains, you know, the, the part of our brain that makes judgments without thinking. Um, and I look at what role the media plays and I look at the backlash against women speaking out and having authority, which is absolutely horrible. Um, but more cheeringly, I look at what men can gain from narrowing the authority mm -hmm. gap. Yeah. So it's not a zero sum game. It is actually a positive sum game, but both of us, both men and women gain from this. Men are twice as likely to say they're satisfied with their lives. I, mean, I can go into this later if you like, yeah. um, but basically in more gender equal countries and relationships, men are much happier. And I, then I, I have a final chapter on what, what we can do about it. And I counted the other day and I've put 140 suggested solutions in the final chapter. So there is no excuse for not changing just a little bit to try to make the world better. Brilliant. That's a great overview. And I want to dig into actually all the aspects and a few more that you haven't mentioned that intrigued me as I was reading the book. But I guess just as a, as a starting point, um, you you know you you mentioned a couple of the personal experiences through the book but actually a lot of it is the interviews with brilliant other women that you have that you've talked about i'd love just to hear you know why did you decide to write it just now and any of what did anything trigger it because you have a wealth of knowledge and i could imagine you having written on lots of different topics so why now well, I decided to write it about four years ago. Okay. Um, well, I was tentatively approached to ask if I'd like to apply to be a visiting fellow of All Souls. And I had to have a research project to do in the course of that year. And I'd been meaning to write a book for ages. And I assumed that I would write a book about British politics. I'd, the, the, the reason why now, it's quite funny. I, so I twice 
agreed and failed to write books when I was younger. You know, I'd even signed contracts and failed to deliver. But, you know, I had a full time job and I had children and I just couldn't fit it in. And then I got to my sort of 40s and 50s and thought, this is fantastic because I have the status of a published author without ever having written a book because everybody just assumes I've written a book because I'm a columnist and I'm, you know, I was reasonably well known. And, and I thought this is brilliant. I, I, I get the best, best of both worlds. Then I started thinking, actually, this is a bit embarrassing that I haven't written a book. And uh, my father wrote quite a lot of books. My grandmother wrote a book. My great grandfather wrote a book. I'm the writer in this generation and I still haven't written a book. Everything I've done has been ephemeral. So when I was approached for this All Souls Fellowship, I thought, right, finally, I will write a book. And I guess it will be about politics. It's what I've spent most of my life writing about. And I came up with three different ideas for books on politics. But this was lurking in the back of my mind. And I bumped into a current fellow, proper fellow of All Souls, not a visiting fellow at a party whom I knew. And, and I said, look, I'm, you know, I'm planning to apply this year and I've got these ideas and I can't decide which one to do. So he said, well, tell me. So I went through the three political ideas and then I said, well, that's another one I've got. It's quite left field. I don't think it's a very All Soulsy subject. Oh. But I would quite like to do it. So I told him about it and he said, that's the one. That's the one you should do. And I said, really, are you sure? Because, you know, I think of All Souls as being very sort of, you know, ultra academic and quite perhaps old fashioned. And he said, no, no, they're trying to change their image. They will love that. The female fellows will love it. The male fellows will think they ought to love it um, and uh, go for it. And as soon as he said it, I realized that was the one I'd really wanted to do. So with it, so then my head was saying politics. My heart was saying the authority gap. Though I didn't yet have the title in my head. And so this was pre me too. This was when this subject still seemed quite niche. It doesn't seem niche now, does it? But it did as recently as four years ago. And I had no, I had no idea me too was going to happen. I had no idea that that was going to create this great sort of wave on which the book would surf. Yeah, no, absolutely. One, and sorry, one, 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 one more yeah. thing actually I've realized is that, um, I mean, I have written about women's issues all through my life now mm. and then. When I had a weekly column, I would occasionally write about that, though more often it was about politics. But I realized, I think, that I had to earn my spurs in the much more male stereotyped worlds of political, well, first of all, business journalism and then political journalism before they would take me seriously enough to read this book. And because I didn't want only women to read it, I wanted men to read it too. But I had to prove to them that I was worth taking seriously, I suppose. So, so it's in, a bit meta. Yeah, no, exactly. And and I guess that was going to be one of my, my questions. You know, you've worked at The Times, at the BBC, very close in on Parliament, so three very iconic British organisations. And I would love to, A, hear whether you've had any differing general sort of kinds of feedback from them, but also how how do they compare in this this gap and and obviously we had international women's day and there was i don't know if you saw the twitter bot that anytime anybody yeah. tweeted it would come up and and sort of the median of this this organization actually the gap is this um this big but but have you had any sort of feedback from that and and how do you view those organizations on their journey i guess to equality let's assume everybody's going to be on this journey now yeah well i mean Let's see, Parliament. So I started writing about Parliament in the mid 80s. I think I'm writing saying it was 3% female, might have been five. But I mean, it was basically men. Mm. And there was the occasional splash of colour when a woman walked into the chamber. Otherwise, it was just all men in grey suits, which was actually very difficult for me because I suffer from something called prosopagnosia, which is known as face blindness. I find it really hard to remember faces and recognize people. So I would walk into the lobby in the House of Commons and be oh. surrounded by this sea of men in gray right. suits. <laughs> no idea who any of them were. <laughs> and it's, easier, <laughs> it's easier to recognize women because uh, their hair is more varied than men's is, their clothes are more varied, you know. Um, oh. So that was a big handicap for me. Um, I suppose I was a novelty so in that respect it was quite handy because I think the men did underestimate me and therefore you know when I took a politician out to lunch he because it almost was a he always was a he would quite often underestimate me and sort of let things slip and relax you know lower his guard um, because he thought I wasn't a threat 
uh, in a way that you might not have done with a man. And so funnily enough, the authority gap in a way was a, a bit of a help. Um, on the other hand, I used to hang out in, uh, and this was a long time ago, it shows my age, but I used to hang out with people like Robin Day and Peter Jenkins and Ian Aitken. And these were all sort of, you know, very senior political chaps who were all members of the Garrick Club. And they would go to the Garrick and come up with these fantastic stories that they gleaned from, you know, cabinet ministers and, and backbenchers in the club. And I wasn't even allowed to, I wasn't even allowed to go into the rooms that they went into, let alone become a member. I still aren't, actually. No, it's, it's um, really incredible. And, and I, I remember the first time I noticed that things were really starting to change was the first time I ever had to queue for the loo at a Labour Party conference because there are enough women there yes. to actually have to keep the loo. <laughs> uh, and, it, and it was because they had said that every constituency party had to send one male and one female delegate. So they were even numbers. And they said the trade unions had to send delegates in proportion to the gender balance of their members. So, you know, USDOR, which was the retail workers union, had to send lots of women, maybe not the NUM minors, but anyway. Um, and it was completely different. The whole atmosphere was different. Instead of just being heaving with what I used to call the beer bullies, mm. you know, these, these sort of huge, um, really bullying trade unionists, it was actually quite civilised for the first time. And I realised what politics could be like if it were just a little bit more gender balanced. It's really interesting. And, and um, because it comes to a question I was going to chat to you about later, but let's, let's take it now, is that sort of positive discrimination, so to speak, or, and and how far you think we want to go down that direction. So, you know, directive from Labour, you must bring a man and a woman per constituency or equivalent proportion to your membership or so on. Do we need to see more of that? Because I know that originally, you know, if I get asked to be on a panel and I can tell it's because I am a woman and the only woman, then I... I might sort of hesitate a little bit and go, do I really want to be there for, for that reason? Or, or am I there because they think I have something interesting to say? Hopefully it's the latter, but yeah. How far do we want to go that? Well, I, yeah. I mean, I, I've witnessed the Labour Party absolutely transform itself from, as I say, having hardly any female MPs at all to now being 50-50 both mm -hmm. in the chamber, you know, the whole parliamentary party and in shadow cabinet. And I think that's fantastic because we live in a representative democracy. We're supposed to be represented and we make up, we women make up 51% of the population. We ought to make up 51% of, of, of our national parliament, I believe. And now, at least on the Labour side, we do. And I think it's transformed politics hugely for the better, hugely. So it's really expanded the universe of politics itself. I remember the first time that Gordon Brown stood up and said, this is a budget for childcare. And this was in, I suppose, the early 2000s. And Harriet Harman had been almost a sort of lone campaigner for more to be done on childcare. And there was a male chancellor standing up and saying, this is a budget for childcare. And I thought, wow, things have really changed because half the, at least half the population, certainly all parents really care about childcare, but it just hadn't been a political issue because none of the men in parliament thought it was important. And now at last it was. So I, I think that positive discrimination can actually achieve an enormous amount. And if you're only aiming for 50-50, it's not like men are going to be flattened or suppressed or anything like that. We're just all going to be equal. And if you look at the caliber of female MPs, they are every bit as good as the male MPs. I mean, it really isn't a problem on the, on the quality control um, <laughs> end of things. Oh, yeah. Know um, that. Um... And oh, sorry, I should just say there are lots of really duff male MPs too. <laughs> when we get as many mediocre women in Parliament as mediocre <laughs> men, I think we'll achieve equality. <laughs> Brilliant. No, and the and on the personal side, have you? How has your family responded to the book? Have, have they been along on your journey in writing it? Um, have you had any feedback that hasn't been brilliant or anything surprising you? Um, well, I have two daughters, so they are hugely loyal and thrilled and, um, you know, feminists themselves. So that's great. Uh, my husband, I, de I dedicate the book to him to die the unlikely feminist. <laughs> 
because even back in the 80s, you know, he's actually quite conservative in his political views. And he was in the army before I met him. But he was he acted in the way that I recommend in the last chapter in the most brilliant way as a partner and as a parent, sharing everything absolutely equally all the way through. He valued my career just as much as he valued his own. Uh, it never occurred to him to expect me to take, you know, the lion's share of housework or childcare or anything like that. Um, and that was pretty amazing, you know, 35 years ago, I think. So he's been great. And he brought me a cup of tea and a chocolate biscuit every afternoon during the writing of the book. <laughs> Brilliant. Maybe he'll even refill your cup um, today. While we're um, but as, as for, as for um, criticism and backlash mm. and that sort of thing, it's been so much less than I expected. And, you know, all the way through the writing of this book, I was quite scared about it. And, and I thought, you know, it's going to be bad. I'm going to have to put up with a lot of trolling, with a lot of abuse. But I think it's worth it because someone's got to say this. And it's easier for me to say it at my age than it is for someone younger. I'm doing this for all these younger women. And someone's just got to speak out. And if you're the first to speak out, you know, you bear the brunt of it. But hey, just going to put up with it. And, and I'd even planned with my husband that if the Twitter trolling got too bad, he would take care of my account and block anyone really vile before I got to see it, all that sort of thing. It hasn't happened, amazingly. Yeah. Um, and, and I don't know why it is. I think it it may be partly my age, though actually Mary Beard suffered I was quite say, a lot. She, I haven't she, been on TV much. I think being on TV is a, uh, is a problem. But, yeah. Um, I think there is so much incontrovertible evidence in the book and I did really want to make it watertight. I mean, God, I put a lot of work into the research because I didn't want skeptics to be able to say, oh, it's just polemic. Uh, you know, it, it, the thesis is wrong or it's out of date, which a lot of men told me when I was writing it from a position of complete ignorance, thereby proving the very point of my book, <laughs> which is that men quite often mansplain to us and challenge our expertise and all that sort of thing. They didn't notice the irony. Um, but, um, but no, I put a huge amount of evidence in. There's a 30-page bibliography. And I it's think incredible. perhaps that might have de deterred some critics. I'm, I'm sure, actually, that that has a lot to do with it because I've certainly never seen that many facts and, and interesting studies and different angles woven together yeah. in that way to say, well, so, so now we've got to this point, you cannot argue with it. And, and in a sense, that's... I guess if you were going to divide the world into male and female all the time, you could say it's a very male thing to have those rational uh, proof points before moving moving forward. So for me, that's part of the brilliance of the book, and I've it's one of the reasons. And everybody knows I do this a lot with book club books, but I've I've got lots of post-it notes and um, and just sort of facts and stats, as you say, ammunition that I don't want to let go of just to um, both, even if it's just for myself, <laughs> to know that this is, um, and we'll come into some of some of them I wanna, I wanna bring up again, because I want everybody to make sure they hear them. And um, did, it, did it surprise you how much, um, how much data, how much, much research there is on this? Or did you, had you already come across it in your, in your career? Because it, there's, there's just so much, you've got the brilliant, qualitative interviews with women leaders from across the world and then you've got the academic studies of all kinds the hardest thing was finding the academic studies because mm. then there, it, it isn't in one di discipline you mm. know normally if you write a non-fiction book suppose a history book you know there's a very sort of narrow uh, field of study that you're looking at and you know that you're going to find everything in that field of study if you just you know spend enough time on it but with mine, it was all over the place. It was like sort of Catherine wheel. Um, was I looking at social psychology or was I looking at linguistics or was I looking at gender studies or was I looking at politics or economics or management or, you know, it just sort of goes on and on. And every time I, I found something in one discipline, that would lead me to another 13 studies in that discipline, each which would lead me to another 13 and sort of started expanding exponentially, which is um, a bit worrying. And eventually I had to say to myself, look, you've just got to stop because this isn't a finite set of um of of research that you can just sort of corral you just at, at some point you simply just have to stop and write which is what i did and actually a lot of the studies i unearthed i didn't didn't even end up in the book oh 
Oh, that's it's, it's kind of good to know that academics are looking at it, I guess, uh, even more than I'd thought. You mentioned this uh, sort of in passing, but I just want to tackle it really head on because I've certainly experienced this. The, it, to some men, I know, a friend of mine, that it feels as if the last few years, it's actually much better to be female and that, the, you know, the, being a white male is now a major disadvantage in anything they try to do. I just want to, I know that you've got some of the facts and stats on this. I can quote them too because I've written it out from the book. But can we just, can we just explode that myth sort of up front that we still don't have equality and parity on on boards and on how women are treated yeah i mean we still got twice as many men as women in parliament representing us and three times as many men as women in cabinet uh, if you look at the top FTSE companies uh 94 of them are run by men and only six by women i mean i don't think you can really say, and they're all almost all white men, I think. I don't think you can really say that white men are being oppressed. Um, if you look at boards, it's still huge majority men, white men. I mean, I, you know, I got a board position recently and a man actually said to me, oh, I bet you only got that because you're a woman. Uh, so I said, oh, that's interesting. Do you think you got your board jobs because you're a white man? <laughs> I suspect you probably did because <laughs> there are still many more. And in yeah. fact, um, when I was writing this book, uh, I was talking to a former editor of mine who's quite arrogant, I would say. I'm not going to name him. Luckily, I've had lots, so you can guess. Um, and he told he told me, oh, no, no, your thesis is completely out of date. You got it all wrong. It's not the case anymore. It's white men who are being oppressed and women get all the best jobs. And he said, I, I sit on all these appointment panels for boards and we only ever appoint women. It's impossible to get a, a, a directorship if you're a man. Mm. I said oh, that's interesting. I don't think you'll find that's actually the case. And he said, oh, no, it is, it is. I know about this sort of thing. So <laughs> thereby, as I say, displaying the very behaviour I'm writing about in the book. Um, so the very next day, by chance, I got my monthly email in which um, they, they just count how many people have been appointed to boards in the previous month. So I opened it out of interest and I counted and it was 20 men and 19 women. <laughs> in other words, it was absolutely sure. fair on men and women. And so I sent him the email and said, I think you'll find that men are still getting a fair crack here. <laughs> but yeah. I think anybody who has a position of privilege, and when I say privilege, I don't mean, you know, social privilege. I mean, simply the, the fact of being a man rather than a woman in this case. You don't notice the privilege. Mm -hmm. I give the analogy of it's a bit like um, men are swimming in a river with the current and you obviously they can't feel the current but they see the riverbanks racing past them and they think, wow, I'm a strong swimmer. And then they see women swimming in the opposite direction against the currents and struggling to make headway. And they think, oh, well, they're clearly just not as good at swimming as I am. <laughs> um, and so, I, and I think when you start to lose this privilege, it feels incredibly threatening, mm. even if you're still nowhere near equality, even if you still got quite a lot of privilege less, left, maybe less than you had before, but still quite a lot left you feel like you're being flattened rather than leveled. Yes, no, and um, yeah, and I, and I think we're gonna see a lot more of that over the next few years as, as equality, as, as the next generations come through, we will still see it. I can see, I'm actually gonna pick this question from Paul because I think we'll then leave um, sort of quotas and positive discrimination. Paul is um, one of our very regular book club um, members He's saying, uh, don't enforce quotas, make things worse by undermining women's credibility and therefore authority. Well, the trouble is we've tried everything else and it hasn't worked. And what tends to happen is that when you introduce the quotas, um, a lot of men say, oh, the women who are appointed are just there because of the quotas and they're clearly not any good. But they quite quickly prove themselves to be just as good as the men. Um, mm. So I would say that's the case with female Labour MPs, for instance. Um, yeah. I will give you an example from a board. I was um, appointed to a board a few years ago, which had, was 125 years old, this company, and had never had a woman on the board. It's been entirely male for 125 years. And so the men realized they had to do something. And to their credit, they actually appointed two women at the same time. I was one of them, which is great because being the only woman is disastrous. It's, mm. it's a terrible dynamic. 
And the other woman, fantastically accomplished and bright, brilliant. I mean, you know, was a really great uh, member of the board. I'm not going to speak for myself. Um, but at the end of the first year, we did a board evaluation survey and we were asked to focus on what had gone particularly well and what hadn't gone so well. And so, you know, I focused on, you know, the performance, investment performance and all this sort of thing, you know, all those sort of operational things about the company. And when the results came back, I realized that the men had all said to a man, they said what had gone particularly well was how easy it had been, how surprisingly easy it had been to have these two women join the board. And I thought, well, that's great, but what were you expecting? <laughs> Why are you so surprised that it would be so hard for two women with exactly the same qualifications as you to fit in to this board? And I was thinking, were they expecting us to pole dance on the board table or what? You know, <laughs> you disappointed um, us though. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe they're disappointed. But I think what I'm saying is that even when this sort of thing happens as a result of quotas, very quickly, if the women are just as good as the men, you know, they get accepted. And and I think in the book you you sort of prove, and, and one of the quotes from you I, I took out of that was, if we ex can accept that women and men are actually maybe barring physical strength completely equal, then why wouldn't there be enough women to be on boards and 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 in politics and yeah. um, lauded as filmmakers or artists or academics um, in in all kinds of the world? And I just saw a very lovely quote from Seb that I just wanted to read out. Um, so Seb says, um, "We have a book club at my company, Web Asset Management, and we read the Authority Gap." While reading the book, I honestly think I tended to discount some of the arguments on the basis that I thought things had got dramatically better and that the issues cited related to media, academia, et cetera, not my sector. And on the basis that I have never seen or experienced these things directly. So it was a real revelation to hear the stories my colleagues shared when we discussed the book and we have so far to go still. Thank you for the book. That's a lovely comment. Thank you, Seb. Um, and I think that's, you, Seb. that's yeah, I, I, I think, sorry. No, go for it. Well, I was going to say, when, when I go and talk to organizations about this, um, one of the things I suggest is that they get their female employees together in a room without any men, guaranteeing them anonymity, and say, please just tell us your stories of what has happened to you in this organization. Uh, they may be fine, but probably they won't be and then show those stories to the senior management, many of whom, probably most of whom will be male, to say, this is the culture of the organization at the moment. Now, you know, what can we do about it? Because as I say, the men aren't going to notice this sort of thing generally, unless it's pointed out to them. Mm. No, absolutely. And, and at least I still believe most men don't, you know, nowadays would not want that to be the culture in their company. Um, and as Seb pointing out, you know, but may, be totally unawares. Oh, I'm not going to unmute you yet, Seb, if that's all right. Feel free to comment in the chat or I'll grab you later. I won't forget, I promise. That's all right. Um, just want to cover a few more bits and pieces. Um, the, so one of, I guess, no, actually, I'll start with yourself a little bit more personal. The just, you mentioned your daughters being feminist and I just wanted to hear a little bit about your journey. Do you, were you always feeling feminist or has that been a journey? Were there any specific instance where you, you decided actually you needed to, to take a stance? Uh, yeah, I've been a feminist since, since I can remember, since I was about two, I think. I mean, every time I saw my brother being, you know, uh, getting to do something that I couldn't do because I was a girl, it made me so angry. And, you know, I was always determined to, to be allowed to do everything he did, to be as successful as him, all these things. Luckily, my parents also had high expectations and, you know, really wanted me to get to go to Oxford and, and to do well in life and to have a career. So that was very helpful. And actually that was one of the common threads I discovered in, with, with all these powerful and authoritative women whom I interviewed for the book, I asked them all about their childhood. And almost to a woman, they said, my father really believed in me. And I thought, how fascinating, also minded, 
Um, but how fascinating that somehow, not just my parents, but my father, as if that gave them the sort of license to achieve in a world of men and the confidence to achieve in a world wow. of men. I thought that was interesting. But I have, no, I've been a feminist all my life, even when it was intensely unfashionable. And uh, I helped to set up an organization called Women in Journalism yes. back in the, oh, I think, 1990s, so more than 20 years ago. And of course, my male colleagues called it Whinge, Women in Journalism. <laughs> yes. <laughs> oh, you're going off to whinge, are you, they say? Of course. Uh, no, that's brilliant. Yeah. And, and I guess that's a really wonderful message for all the men and, and the fathers of small children here is, and it, it comes through in the book, of course, as well, of giving your daughters that permission and that confidence that it seems fathers in particular can, um, can convey and making a, a huge difference. You had some really wonderful personal stories of the two academics in Stanford, but I w just wanted to talk a little bit more about that, which was, I think, as I agree with you, a slam dunk chapter. Um, are there lots of studies on this yet, or are you? Did you? Was there anything more that um, that that could illustrate, or more evidence on on different ways that 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 particular group is? is treated, I guess. Uh, um, well, yes, so I mentioned Ben Barris, uh, well, you mentioned Ben Barris, who was a neuroscientist at Stanford. And he said, once he started living as a man, I've had the thought a million times, I'm just taken more seriously now. He said, my work is taken more seriously, the same damned work, as he put it, is taken more seriously now that people see me as a man. And he told that anecdote about the guy in the back of his seminar who didn't know his history saying, oh, his work's so much better than his sister's, <laughs> i.e. himself. And he also said that because he grew a beard and started suffering male pattern baldness because of the testosterone he'd taken, um, other men treated him like a man. And he started overhearing what they would say about women when there were no women in the room. And he found that pretty shocking just how patronizing and misogynist they were, uh, which of course we as women never get to hear because we're not there unless we sort of hide behind a curtain somewhere. Um, and meanwhile, Joan Roughgarden was also a science professor at Stanford and transitioned in the opposite direction at the same time. And they used to compare notes. Uh, and she said when she was living as a man, when she was young, she felt like she was just on this conveyor belt to success. And her pay rose really fast and she got promoted really fast. And she said, I spoke and people listened. And she was given a seat on the university Senate committee. And she said it was fantastic. It was just sort of automatic, really. And then she started living as a woman. She said all that changed. And she came up against all these instances of authority gap behavior that I've been talking about, you know, not being able to you know, not being able to finish a sentence without it being finished by a man, making a point at a meeting, no one takes any notice until a man makes it, being patronized, being attacked personally. She said, which had never happened to her before. People would say things to her like, well, you clearly haven't read the literature. She said, no one ever dared do that to me when I was, when I was living as a man. And she said to start with, I thought, well, if I'm going to live as a woman, I'm darn well going to be discriminated against like a woman. And then she said, well, the thrill of that has worn off, I can tell you. And her conclusion was men are assumed to be competent until proven otherwise. Women are assumed to be incompetent until they prove otherwise. And that's pretty much the thesis of the book, actually, is that we just are our, our default expectation of women is so much lower than it is of men. And in fact, studies show that women are twice as likely as men to say that they have to prove their competence. They have to provide evidence of their competence and much more likely than men to say that people are surprised at their ability. And if we're starting from a lower default assumption, then women have to work so much harder to climb up, you know, to the same level as men. But there, there have been, in answer to your question, there have been bigger studies of trans people and only two that I came across, there might've been more since, um, both of which showed exactly this phenomenon that uh, trans men in particular say once they start living as a man, it's amazing. It's just so much easier. It's really great. They just have more authority. People respect them more. People take them more seriously. They use that phrase. People take me more seriously now. Um, and trans women find exactly the opposite and often say, gosh, I had no idea of the extent of sexism until I started living as a woman. I know it's, it's incredible. And you just 
touched on something you mentioned at the very beginning, which was this, this confidence versus competence. And I, I've wanted just to dig in a little bit more because it was one of the pl places I felt a bit guilty, actually, that um, when I go through a hiring process and we've been hiring um, quite a few people recently, I or we uh, tend to hire for fit and potential and curiosity to learn and not a very strict set of criteria, which I guess goes um, against some of the recommendations you put in the book. And so I'm trying to figure out how do we how do we change that? And, and we're a small company, we do something sort of fairly specific and yet very broad um, in terms of sustainability and innovation and, and helping companies transform. But I'd love to hear whether there are any top tips when 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 our jobs, I guess, are are slightly more fluid than than a standard set of competences. Um, if you've got anything on that, I would love love, love the help. But we're yes. we're kind of actively thinking about it right now. Hiring for fit is disastrous because what you're doing is you are, you are explicitly using your affinity bias. Mm. In other words, we want to hire people like us. Mm. Uh, I mean, you're a woman, you're a senior woman. Maybe that means you'll hire women, but then that's but then that's unfair on men um, because you should be hiring the best person for the job. And actually, more diverse teams, so people who are unlike you, actually make better decisions. So there's been a lot of evidence on this um, that they don't necessarily rub along together as smoothly, mm. but they do end up making better decisions and solving more difficult problems if they're more diverse. And therefore, yeah. you're much better off. You're actually much better off hiring someone who won't fit, which sounds sounds paradoxical, but would probably help. Um, but if I can just give you a few ideas on hiring. So to start with, 70 percent of men are, will, will evaluate a man more highly than a woman for achieving exactly the same goals. And that rises to 75% for men in senior positions. So that's quite chilling, isn't it? That makes you think, gosh, I've got to be very scientific about this. Women apparently are much more accurate about it, um, but, 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 but men aren't. Um, and the other thing that men are, I think, um, a little bit worse at, so sometimes the bias is in women too, but in this case, men are five times more likely to say they don't want to work with a woman who negotiates than with a man who negotiates. And given that we're always being told as women, oh, the gender pay gap's all your fault. If only you asked for more money, you'd get it. No, you wouldn't, particularly if it's a male hiring you. You wouldn't even get the job in the first place, probably. So, um, so I think that's a bias that we need to examine. Blind applications are, are much more successful than ones that have a name at the top. So mm. one, one research study sent CV and app, job applications for a lab manager position to science professors in American universities. And it was a randomized controlled trial and they randomly assigned a male or a female name to the top. And, but they were identical CVs and letters. And the so-called male candidate was deemed significantly more hireable, more competent, was offered a higher starting salary and the professors were keener to collaborate with him than the woman. And this was male and female science professors doing the hiring. So here the bias is, is there amongst the women as well as amongst the men. And so that's why blind applications are more successful. Uh, of course, you could, not much help when you get to the interview, but nonetheless, it's a start when it comes to the yeah. system. So for the Hubble Space Telescope, um, applications used to be done with people's names on and men got much more time on the telescope than women did. Once they'd used blind applications, women actually outperform men. Um, we can ask job applicants to perform tasks as well as interview them. I think this is a very useful thing to do. So invent a task that is similar to the sort of thing they'll have to do if they're doing the job. And then you can actually judge them by their competence and not by how good they tell you they are, i.e. probably their confidence. Because yeah. If, for instance, at a job interview, you ask what might sound like an innocuous question, which is, so tell us the achievement you're proudest of. A woman will feel very awkward because we have been socialized not to self-promote. And in fact, we are punished if we self-promote. Again, studies show that women who are self-promoting, we tend to dislike and recoil from and don't want to hire. And yet a job interview is a whole process of self-promotion, isn't it? 
And so if you ask that sort of question, a woman might cringe and then think, oh, I'll do something safe. She'll say something like my two beautiful children. Whereas a man will say, well, in my last job, I doubled sales and quadrupled profit margins. And yeah. he'll say, oh, he's the one I want to, he's the one I want to hire. So, I mean, uh, gosh, there are so many other things. If you have only one woman on a selection panel, you pretty much, um, you pretty much sort of abolish the chances of a woman being hired at all. This is what evidence shows. It makes it almost impossible for a woman to be hired because what happens is that the men on the panel think, oh, we don't have to worry about diversity. She's taking care of that. And the woman on the panel thinks they're just going to think I'm being nepotistic if I recommend the female candidate. And so it actually decreases almost a vanishing point, the chances of a woman being hired, as does having only one woman on a short list, because what it's doing is subliminally telling us that men are four or five times better at this sort of job, you know, however many men you've got. Um, and therefore, you're much more likely to hire a man. So you should always have at least two women on a selection panel. Um, there are many more suggestions in the back of the book. Yes, no, there's the lots of brilliant suggestions. Thank you. I should add just to to save all my my colleagues that yeah we, we we I think we have a fairly diverse team because John insists on us hiring what he calls mutants. So everybody has very uh, mixed up backgrounds and sort of displaced people in general. But but that was really really helpful I think for everyone to just hear some of those really practical tips. Um, there was one thing, and again, we've touched on it, and it really struck me, um, was this idea of women not being expected to and liked if they disrupt or challenge. And, and actually, you talked about trolling earlier. It made me think of, of the young Greta Thunberg, that, yes. that it feels like she really went, it got the, a brunt of that type of... Um, type of, of, of emotional reaction from lots of people. Um, and, and linked to that, you say in the book that men are more likely to be influenced sort of by the hyper feminine, um, even though they might not think that the, the very feminine uh, female is more knowledgeable or more competent, but they will listen more anyway, which I thought was a really fascinating sort of mind bending thing. And it reminded me of, I think it's Hillary Clinton who talked about the pink tax that a woman could decide, sort of women in the public eye could choose to pay or not, whether they spend time and effort trying to look nice. And I think she famously hired a stylist and said, right, I'm gonna pay and spend the time and effort. But your the book seems to slightly make the, well, no, make the case that actually women are still, whether they pay that pink tax physically or not um, for their looks, they are paying a mental load in a sort of tax in trying to be heard, taken seriously, not being too aggressive, not being, you know, being feminine, but not too too much and so on. Yeah, so, uh, sorry. No, go, go, that was exactly right. <laughs> right. That was my setup. <laughs> yeah. No, that's exactly right. Because, you know, either you're, as a woman, you're either not confident enough and therefore disrespected, or you are confident enough and therefore disliked. <laughs> And you may say, well, you know, who cares about whether you're liked or not? You should just grow thicker skin. Trouble is that likability is a much more important factor when it comes to hiring or promotion for women than it is for men, particularly if it's men doing the hiring or the promoting. So what we have to do as women, and, and uh, almost all the women I interviewed for the book said exactly this, is we the only way through this sort of incredibly narrow um, path between being underconfident and overconfident is to overlay this huge amount of warmth onto our personalities so that we don't seem threatening and we don't seem scary uh, to men in particular, though to women as well. And it's, it, you know, we, so, you know, we smile a lot when we're talking. I can, here I am watching myself on Zoom and I'm smiling, uh, even though it's not really funny, is it? <laughs> um, only in a dark way. Uh, you know, so we smile more and we use humour to leaven any sort of hostility that might otherwise arise. And we read the room very carefully and we have to be phenomenally emotionally intelligent. Um, and we have to be incredibly nice to people. You know, it it's exhausting. <laughs> it's it's the only way through, but it's exhausting. And it's a burden that men absolutely don't have to bear. You know, if a male CEO is described as tough, you admire him for it. If a woman CEO is described as tough, you think, oh, she's a bitch and I dislike her. So, you know, 
you really have to work so much harder as a woman to get this right. And I think, again, that's something that men don't notice, but we really do because it's just so much effort. Yeah, and, and I hate having to say it. I hate particularly saying to young women, this is what you've got to do because it just seems wrong. The system shouldn't be like this. And, you know, and I don't want them to have to be inauthentic, but it is like this. This is what the world is like. And it may be in three generations time, we won't have to do this anymore. But at the moment we do. And I would hate to give young women advice that means they're going to get stalled in their careers because they're too blunt and, you know, don't get hard and don't get promoted. No, absolutely. And I and sort of personally, I know that I pick and choose. And actually, my my daughter, my oldest daughter, Frida, um, wants to challenge me because I know that I'm sort of sometimes I think oh, I don't need the oxygen in the room. Let everybody else talk. It's all fine. And I remember her. She must have been a young teenager just sort of saying to me, well, actually, this was a social situation. She said, but mommy, you've got much more experience than these guys. You know, you know, you could, you know, why are you not saying anything? And, and I think at that in this particular setting, I'd kind of thought, it's fine, everybody has a story to tell, just let them get on with it. And you do that picking and choosing, don't you? But but I did feel guilty um, because she'd seen it and you want to also be a good role model that that takes the space and, and shows that equal talking time of men and women, don't you? But it's so difficult because so often, I don't know how many times you've been at a dinner party, remember them? <laughs> and, uh, and you're sitting next to a man on each side and you know, I'm, I'm, I'm very polite, I've been well brought up and also I'm a journalist by training, so I like asking people questions and I will interview them for hours. Hmm. about and uh, you know about themselves and about their life and their work and their family and where you know all this sort of thing and sometimes they don't ask me a single question not a single question I mean this happened to me once when I was presenting start the week and I sort of dropped the odd hint into the conversation that I you know I did have an interesting life myself and but he, he didn't pick up on any of these he just talked about himself 100% of the time and the next day because we were staying with some friends on holiday another man asked me oh what's it like presenting start the week and man number one from the dinner turned around like this and he said do you present start the week and I just said yes and I turned (laughs) back again I thought four syllables would have listed that for me the night before all he had to ask was what do you do (laughs) (laughs) of course not all men you know some men are fantastic I'm sure all the men on this Zoom are fantastic at, you know, asking questions and being just as interested and not doing what I call conversational man spreading, you know, taking up disproportionate conversational time because um, you probably wouldn't be here if you were that sort of man. And we love, we really notice and really appreciate when men do treat us equally and are just as interested in us as we are in them and all that. Exactly. Um, no, I, I think that's good. There are, um, oh, um there are lots of questions and there's one that I hadn't thought of and Teen who's one of our wonderful um book club members from from the US she runs a, a women and, and girls focused uh, social enterprise called Rockflower but she's saying with the peace talks between Russia and Ukraine there are no women delegates and there were no women delegates for the Doha peace talks with Afghanistan and that this well documented that women when women are part of negotiations for peace, they are better executed, they last longer, and 35% more likely to last 15 years or more. I didn't know this, Teen. Um, yeah. Could you share your thoughts on why we are going backwards on this particular issue of the authority gap? I despair. I really despair of this sort of strong man model of political leadership. I mean, look where it's taken us. Trump, Putin, Bolsonaro, um, Erdogan, yeah, it's just horrible. It and it and it's it's it, it, it's such a bad way of leading. It's it, it's not just that I dislike it as a woman. They lead their countries so much worse. Look at the death toll from COVID in their countries, let alone going to war. And yes, um, w- w- was it Trina? Did you say I, I missed the Trina, name? Trina, Trina, yeah. Um, it's completely right. There have been academic studies showing that involving women in peace talks makes them much more successful. I can sort of understand why Putin hasn't, because there there doesn't seem to be a single strong woman around him in any capacity. (laughs) I'm amazed that Zelensky hasn't. Yeah, that is very amazing, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. Um, And actually on that that type of leadership, one of the things I'm asking lots of people at the moment is, is this shift from 
the type of leadership we see, this sort of hero leadership to, um, and well, my question to you, I guess, is do you think that the next version isn't just replacing men with women, but having more collaborative, slightly more diverse groups of leaders rather than, than the single one? That's my theory at the moment, but I'd love your thoughts on it. Possibly. Uh-huh. I mean, what, what I would like to see is that for it to be the absolute default that in, at any level of leadership, you have a man and a, and a woman running it. So it might be a chair and a CEO, either mm-hmm. male chair, female CEO, or the other way around, and then further down and further down and further down. Because I think that it's you just get a very good sort of complementary approach mm-hmm. to leadership when you've got a man and a woman working together. It just works really well. And if you did that, in one generation, you would actually get gender equality too, because you would get an equal number of men and women at lead, in leadership at every level. As it, for, in terms of group collaboration, um, I mean, obviously the best leaders are those who listen to their subordinates and don't, aren't just always on transmit, but are on receive as well. Um, but you do need to have someone to take a decision in the end. And, so, you know, if you look at how communes always fall apart because they're, oh, yeah. to have, you know, co-ops or whatever, <laughs> they try to have, it, does, it just doesn't work all that well, I have to say. But I, I have been fascinated during the pandemic by how successful leaders like Jacinda Ardern have been. And I think people have noticed that. I hope men have noticed mm. it as well as women, that the combination of, em- I think, empathy and listening to the experts and lack of bluster. Um, so it's, it's not that all male leaders have been bad, but a particular type of male leader has been bad. The ones I talked about earlier, and yeah. I would include Boris Johnson in that, the sort of blustering, you know, oh, I'll take this vaccine, you know, and you are, our country is not going to suffer the way others have, as if a vaccine cared <laughs> what a prime minister or a president looked like. Um, and I think that women on the whole have been sort of calmer, more rational, more willing to lock down early. And then that meant they could also release earlier on the whole. And so the countries that locked down earlier actually did better in economic terms, not worse. It wasn't a trade-off, as well as a lot better in terms of death and health. No, absolutely. Um, I'm now trying to, just going through a few of the questions. They're coming thick and fast suddenly. Um, I see a question from Valentina on attracting enough women to post a job. The, this whether you have any tips when women don't feel they have the qualifications, they, they don't apply, whereas I think the stats is that men need to feel they cover 30%, then they will apply and women 100 or something like that. It's similar to that, it might be 60, I think. But um, I mean, I think the onus is very much on managers to encourage women to apply for jobs, actually go to them rather mm-hmm. than wait for them to apply. Um, and the same with headhunters. Because it's true that women often feel they've got to be 100% qualified before they're prepared to apply. And men just don't seem to have that constraint. Maybe some men do, but most don't. Um, So, uh, and because on the whole, women tend to be less confident than men, which isn't surprising given that they come up against this behavior the whole time. And if whenever you speak up in a meeting, you get talked over or your views ignored or you get patronized or you get challenged, you know, eventually you're going to think, is it really worth it? Yeah. And, and all these things are going to dent your confidence, aren't they? Men on the whole, unless they work for a complete bully, don't have these challenges to their confidence the same way. And so women are on average going to feel less confident. And men on average tend to overestimate their ability, studies show. Women tend to either be accurate about their ability or underestimate it. So they just need to be encouraged to apply. And I, yeah, I think the onus is on managers to do that. No, absolutely. Um, and one thing, I don't think you say it explicitly in the book, but it's that thing of learning to value the quiet people or the introverts. There seemed to be a trend, a separate trend, um, sort of saying the, the value of the introvert. Do you think that there's something that links that with the gender equality piece? Um, I think there's an overlap. I think it's a Venn diagram. Mm. Um, so shy men overlap with lots of women. <laughs> when it comes to speaking out at meetings. Um, but, but most men don't have the pushback that I've been talking about. And therefore you've got to be quite introvert to feel bad about speaking up in a meeting if you're a man. Whereas the majority of women, in fact, almost all women get this pushback. So you've got to be extremely confident uh, to ignore it and to carry on talking nonetheless. Yeah, no, absolutely. Um, uh, and one other thing, I had a I had a conversation actually about this with, with a, 
a woman I really admire not that long ago, she said she was in academia and she said, well, if I have a choice of do I focus on writing a paper or do I build, create something, solve a problem that might be improvement for the organization, the students or the world, I will always end up choosing the latter to the detriment of the prestige of sort of attached to the writing that she needs to really needs to do to, to keep progressing. Do you think that there's a... Um, is that innate? Is that something learnt? You know, this idea of, of, of fixing and, and rather than the, the writing that might be better for herself. I suppose we, most of us grow up in households in which our mother solves more of the problems than our father. And so it may be that that is sort of learned behaviour. And women are much more likely to be asked to solve problems, aren't they, than mm. men, probably because we feel bad about saying no. Or, you know, if, if a man says, sorry, too busy writing my writing up my research, people think, oh, well, never mind, I'll try someone else. But a woman mm. says that, they think, oh, that's well, she's not very helpful. <laughs> exactly. She's not very helpful because we have w w these stereotypes about how women ought to behave, which are called communal character traits. And that all of us have them buried deep in the recesses of our brains, however feminist we think we are. We've grown up with these stereotypes that say that women ought to be kind and gentle and warm and nurturing and unselfish and helping out whenever there's a problem and also unthreatening and unassertive and unconfident and unself-promoting. Um, and these are characteristics which are wonderful for an organization that wants women just to, you know, make the tea and organize the Christmas party and help colleagues in distress, but it's not going to help the woman yeah. at all. Yeah. And you know, the trouble is once she starts showing the character traits that, uh, that, are, that are called agentic rather than communal, which we associate more with men, which is being dominant and confident and assertive and in charge and showing leadership, we don't like it. And we turn against her, as, as I said earlier, you know, we use all these adjectives about her. And actually what those adjectives are doing are telling us much more about ourselves than about the woman in front of us. What they're telling us is that she's going against stereotype and that makes us feel uncomfortable. She may not be at all unlikable, or bossy or overbearing or any of these things. It's our reaction to her. Um, so Crystal Moore has has popped in a question, which I think is relevant here. So do you think talking about yin and yang in the ba in balance would make the conversation open up more rather than the sort of female male opposing dynamic? So sort of can looking back to Eastern collective cultures help us move away from an individualistic male dominated one, do you think? I'm not an expert on that. <laughs> and unlike, uh, men are much more likely to bullshit than women. Yeah, by I was going to say, but you can have an opinion, Marianne. It's, we would love it. <laughs> um, I mean, yes, all diversity makes for better leadership. And that's why I talked about having a man and a woman, having people with the yin or yang characteristics working together. Anything that is complementary is going to make for better leadership. Um, I don't think you can change a whole country's culture, though. So I think it's going to be very hard to change the UK or the US away from an individualistic culture and towards a very communal one like, say, Japan or China, just as, you know, it's very hard to make Japan individualistic. We've had millennia of, um, right. of you know, Judeo-Christian on one side and Buddhism on the other, um, influencing how we're brought up and, and what we believe are good character traits. No, that, that, um, that's great. I'm realizing that, Seb, I promised to come back to you. Um, did you want to put it in the chat? Are you still here? Well, can or, you hear me? Oh, I can. Um, um, thank you very much. I've thoroughly enjoyed this conversation. It's been lovely to, to, to hear from you directly, having read the book. I mean, I guess it was just a, a reflection and I, 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 you know, I, I, um, a little anecdote as well. I, was, I went to a meeting uh, I was late for a meeting the other day and I, I came into the room and there were four people from the company that we were meeting with and I was slightly flustered and I'm ashamed to say that my, my eyes slightly kind of glazed over the woman who was sitting in the middle of the table from the company and alighted on the man, the much younger man beyond her Ooh. and sort of caught his eye to sort of acknowledge, you know, sorry wow. I'm late, came in. But then I sat down and I, I realised immediately what I'd done. I, I, I just thought it was quite a... I mean, you, one of the points you make in the book is a lot of this is very deep for, for men and for women. And I think that partly the challenge is just to notice and kind of learn from that experience when you notice, because inevitably, 
none of us are perfect and we're trying to to get better at this but there are you know we will fall occasionally and i think it's just about noticing that and then hoping you know trying to do better next time oh thank you seb that is so that is so much the message of the book is that you know we it's called unconscious bias for a reason so we can't change the bias in our brains but we can notice when we do that sort of thing and then correct for it so it was brilliant that you noticed and i'm sure you won't do it again now and once we become more aware we can change our behavior but we just need to be aware we need to be we just need to notice much more so yeah thank you no and that brings me on to um one of the most startling facts i thought was was this idea that by age five or six i think both boys and girls and their parents believe that boys are inherently cleverer than girls <laughs> <laughs> oh, I found this so depressing. It was probably the most, probably the saddest research I uncovered, apart from the horrible um, trolling um, that I talk about the, in the penultimate chat. Um, because there was this academic study done asking parents to estimate their children's IQ. And they estimated their sons on average at 115 and their daughters at only 107. Despite the fact that girls actually develop faster than boys, have a bigger vocabulary than boys, outperform boys at school from kindergarten up to PhD. I mean, you know, there, and there is no, the, 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 the IQ distribution is identical for boys and girls, except at the very far ends. Um, so there's absolutely no excuse for believing that your daughters are less clever on average than your sons. And the same researchers then asked adult men and women to estimate their own IQs. And the adult men estimated them on average at 110, and the women at 105. And again, our IQs are on average identical, but boys have been brought up subliminally to absorb this notion that they are intellectually superior to girls and they are not. It is an incorrect notion, but that's what they've been brought up to believe and girls absorb it too. And yes, there was the study, the other study you cited was of five, six and seven year olds. And the first, the first um, experiment they did was the adults said, there's this one colleague in my company who's really, really smart and always manages to solve problems. Who do you think it is? And they showed them a picture of a man and a woman. At the age of five, the girls chose the woman and the boys chose the man. By six and seven, the boys were still choosing the man, so were the girls. And then they were asked if they, to choose uh, teammates for a game for really, really smart kids. And again, at five, girls were choosing girls, boys were choosing boys by six and seven they were both more likely to choose boys even though they knew that they actually asked in the study the children whether they knew that girls did it did actually did better at school than boys at that age got higher grades and the oh. children knew this but they still chose boys it's huge isn't it and it's huge it, and so that leads me to and John, John's actually put a question in on this but it's sort of what are the early stage interventions that can help narrow that gap in young people so this is going to be the subject of my next book is what can we do in childhood <laughs> because it starts so young and I just I, I, I want to discover more I mean I've come, come across quite a lot already the very first thing we have to do if we're in a straight relationship is that both parents have to have equal authority at home because we are role modeling this for our children and that's more important than anything else if your mother has as much authority as your father you're going to grow up believing that women have as much authority as men so that really matters. And, you know, the father has to respect the woman, listen to what she says, uh, you know, respect if she's working, uh, her career should have as much importance as his, if that's what she wants, all that sort of thing. Then you've got to stop stereotyping the children. Don't praise your daughters for being pretty and your sons for being clever or brave or good at football. Or children will grow up with the notion, boys will grow up with the notion that, that they will achieve through doing things. You know, they will be admired for, for achievement, in other words, and girls will grow up believing they'll be admired for being ornamental rather than instrumental. And that is a terrible message. And think how often you've said to either your daughter or someone else's, oh, what a pretty dress, or oh, how pretty you look. We've got to stop doing that. I've, I, you know, I find myself doing it, I now stop. And I always ask them, you know, oh, what book have you enjoyed reading recently? Or do you play sports or just something more yes. interesting? Like that. And it's um, that of doing, right? And creating rather than yeah. being, um, which is a really exactly. different um, game. Yeah. Sorry. Yeah. 
that's right. Uh, and then we we mustn't gender stereotype um, the chores that we ask them to do. No reason why you know girls sh daughters should help mummy cook and son should help daddy mend the car or something. Um, and and indeed, uh, you know the the games they play and the sports they do. My my father, I've only got we've only got um, daughters. Sorry, my husband was always encouraging them to climb trees, be really physically brave. You know, and that's really stood them in good stead in later life. They just feel brave people. And I think that I think that helps in all sorts of ways. Um, we can make sure so parents interrupt their daughters more than their sons can stop doing that because that's teaching the sons that they have a right to interrupt their sisters. Um, stop them if they're doing it. Um, and if they show the girls any disrespect, stop them. Uh, as I said earlier, believe in your daughters and your sons, obviously, but believe in your daughters just as much and encourage them to be interested in non-stereotypical careers. No reason why your son shouldn't be a teacher and your daughter an engineer. Um, and then talk about the outside world a lot with them. So, you know, if you see an ad or a Disney film, which is sexist, take it apart, dissect it afterwards and say, did you notice, you know, the girl was just expected to you know, to marry the prince, but the boy got to do all these adventures. Now, why was that? That's not fair, is it? That's not right. Try and find yes. books for them that have girls showing agency and not just being decorative or, or a, a follower. Um, these are all things we can do yeah. to start with. Brilliant things. Um, yeah, and I look forward to that book. So, uh, <laughs> yeah, and, and, and presumably that book will, like this, come with a movement needed. So. Um, and um, oh, I'm looking at oh, there's an interesting nature nurture question there. Yes, I'd like to answer. Oh, yes, please do. Yeah, is it, it, it? Do you think that all the differences between men and women's behaviour is due to nurture, or is there an element which is due to predisposition, stroke nature, stroke genetics? I think there is an element uh, which is due, due. I would say more to hormones actually, to testosterone. And it can't be a coincidence that 95% of murderers are men. Um, and, and I think well over 90% of, of violent crimes are perpetrated by men. Um, and, I, you know, boys on the whole do tend to be rougher, more energetic, more violent with each other than girls. So, I, and they do, even prepubescent boys have a bit more testosterone than girls do. So I think that does make a difference. But on the other hand, if these differences were entirely... Or, or much more due to nature and uh, genetics, then they would be the same in every society all over the world, and they are not. So there was a fascinating study done by some economists, which I cite in the book, about competitiveness. Yeah. And people are always saying, oh, men are just naturally more competitive than women. Yeah, it's to do with testosterone, or it's to do with the fact that they used to hunt mam mammoths and all we did was pick berries, you know? <laughs> um, it just goes, it's evolutionarily determined. If this were the case, it would happen everywhere and it doesn't. So uh, these economists looked at a matriarchal society called the Kazi in India, and they compared it with a patriarchal society, the Maasai in Tanzania. And they tested how competitive the men and women were in both societies. And not only were the Kazi women more competitive than the Kazi men, this was in the matrilineal society, they were even more competitive than the Maasai men. <laughs> so that suggests that it's very much more social conditioning than nature or hormones or genes, I would say. And it's true also with things like mathematical ability. So girls, the more gender equal a country is, the better girls are at maths. Now, if it were an innate brain thing that, men, you know, boys are just better at systematizing and girls are better at empathy, which we're often told, then uh, it would be the same in every country, but it's not. And in some countries, girls are actually better than boys at maths. Yes, I was happy that my home country, well, my original home country, Denmark, got a little mention for, for being a little bit more equal. Though yeah. I'm still not sure, at least when I was growing up there, it, there was definite differences in how I was treated versus my cousins and or male cousins. Um, I, I think when we're we're coming up to half past. That was an hour and a half flying by, Mary. Do you remember yeah. I said it? <laughs> Uh, and there are, I'm still seeing questions sort of coming okay. in. Um, I'm just going to pick a couple, actually. Um, there was, uh, oh, so Harriet asked, 
just and, and maybe um, feel free if any of the especially if the men have ideas put it in the chat Harriet asks how do you teach the male species to notice in the first place like that beautiful example Seb gave us of realizing what he was doing as he was doing it hmm. um, I, I recommend that um that managers should have reverse mentor male managers should have reverse mentors who are female more junior women who can reverse mentor them and some companies do this already and uh, in fact, I interviewed General Sinek Carter, who was chief of the defense staff, um, mm -hmm. you know, head of all the armed forces. And he said he had a reverse mentor who was a, a more junior, much more junior female civil servant at the uh, Ministry of Defense. And he said it was brilliant. She really opened his eyes to the way he was behaving. And she would say to him after meetings, you know, you talked over that woman or you took up too much conversational time. Or I noticed, you know, when a woman started talking, you checked your phone for emails or something. <laughs> uh, I'm making that up, but you know what I mean. And he said it was really eye opening. So I think that's a useful thing for men to do. That's brilliant. And um, just listen different. to women, ask, ask them, uh, you know, ask them for their experience. Um, and this is going to be, I think, the last the last chunky question because both Claire has asked it, and then Sophie, who is my co-host, who you've uh, you've met, Marianne, um, has, has also has sent it to me. And I don't know, Sophie, do you want to just talk it out because I think it co coincides both with what Claire is say, say, saying, but also with sort of ending up with the younger women getting the last word here, which is quite unusual. I'm gonna both mute and stop listening. Okay, great. Um, okay, now I'm in a position of power I didn't expect it to be in. Um, so it's, yeah, it's sort of, it's echoed, Claire said it and I kind of echo it in a slightly different angle. Claire said, um, without making those most badly affected do all the work, do you have thoughts on effective ways to respond when faced with the authority gap in a business or academic setting? And um, I'd just sort of like to add to that as someone starting out in my career, how to respond to it when you're faced with that in both a professional and a personal setting, maybe particularly in a personal setting when discussing what you do for work um, without sort of just being labeled as fussy or a, a militant feminist and actually be taken seriously. It's yeah, it's a really good question. It's such a difficult one to answer. So for years, I would find, decades actually, I would find, uh, I should start by saying, I, so I was an assistant editor at the Times and I would meet a man at a party or something for the first time. And he'd ask me, what do you do? And I'd say, I'm a journalist. And he'd go, freelance, you know, start at the bottom. <laughs> and I'd say, no, actually I'm on staff. Ooh, he'd say, and where do you work? And I'd say, the Times. Ooh, he'd say, and what do you do there? And his voice would rise in pitch with every iteration of this. And he would think he was being flattering somehow. Ooh, you know, aren't you senior and successful? But actually it was quite insulting because the implication was, I assumed you were going to be junior and boring until you proved otherwise. And I guess that's the sort of thing you're talking about, Sophie, this you know, assumption that what you do is quite junior and trivial and uninteresting. And I didn't have the confidence to challenge it for a very long time, and to, for at least 20 years, I should think, until eventually when this happened, I'd start saying, just out of interest, if I'd been a man, would you have started the conversation the same way? Would you have asked me if I were freelance? And generally they'd go, um, no, probably not. <laughs> and then I'll explain, you know, I'd explain why, um, why it mattered. But you're right. Then suddenly you're prickly, you're difficult, you are oversensitive. Quite often they will gaslight you and say, oh, no, no, no. I, you know, of course I was listening to what you were saying um, and make you feel like you're the stupid one. Um, or the or the sort of paranoid one. I think recruiting allies is often the best. So if there is a man in a meeting who is particularly offensive in this way, and you don't feel you can call it out, have a quiet word either with whoever was chairing the meeting afterwards and say, I don't know if you noticed the way John kept talking over me or challenging me every time I made an assertion, but I actually find it quite annoying and I'd love it if next time he did that, you could pick him up on it on my behalf. Um, if you don't dare ask whoever's chairing the meeting, recruit an ally, even at your level, but not yourself, who can say, suppose you're interrupted, can say, oh, hang on, I was really interested in what Sophie was saying there. Or suppose you make a point and no one takes any notice. Ten minutes later, John makes the same point and your ally can say, oh, I'm so glad you agreed with what Sophie said earlier. <laughs> so that's my advice. If you don't want to stand up for yourself, try and find an ally who'll do it for you. 
Sounds like great advice. Sophie's smiling. There you go. Heart. Heart. Oh, yes. um, <laughs> and I think on that note, we will just thank you for the hour and a half and brilliant advice and thoughts and laughter and smiles that we were both very smiley. <laughs> um, well, um, and thank you to everybody for, um, for joining in. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Thank you, everyone. Bye for now.